Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of the uh, Jason Hagcomb Sports Experience. I am joined today by Jason Pat of SB Nation, uh, a big basketball writer, a guy that covers the Chicago Bulls a lot. And uh, Jason, thanks for coming on to the show today. Thanks for having me on. How you doing? Uh, I'm doing great and ready to talk some basketball. Um, so, Jason, obviously, last night was the NBA All Star Game, and Russell Wilson was named, or sorry, Russell Westbrook was named uh, MVP of the All Star Game with 41 points. I mean, he had the same intensity that Pete Rose did of the 1970 MLB All Star Game. Uh, do you think his performance can ignite the Thunder towards a strong run towards the postseason? Well, it looks like that that had already kind of started even before yesterday's game, and Westbrook had been a big part of that right before the break. The first game before the break uh, was against the, uh, the last game before the break was against the Grizzlies, and they pretty much beat them down. It was They basically had blew them off in the first half and then just held the game for the second half, and that was a huge win for them because a few weeks before that, they had gone into Memphis, and they had scored like only 74 points. They looked bad, and everyone was wondering, what's wrong with the Thunder? Are they not going to be able to make the playoffs this year? But ever since they lost that game, I think they've won something like five of six. Westbrook had those two games in, against the Pelicans where he put up like 90-some points combined. KD's back, and looks like he's getting healthy. And like I said, with that, with that win over the Grizzlies right before the break, that's the team that many expected them to be this year, one of the top title contenders. And if they can play like that moving forward, I don't see how they don't make the playoffs. Because right now I believe they're half game behind the Suns. Suns are reeling a bit. The Pelicans, Anthony Davis is hurt, and I don't know if they'll have enough, especially if he's hurting the rest of the year, to keep up with the Thunder, who are looking like the team that will get that last playoff spot. Well, I mean, there's were lots of moments in the All-Star game last night. I mean, Westbrook set an NBA All-Star game record with 27 points in the first half. Uh, LeBron moved past Michael Jordan with uh, total points in an All-Star game. Uh, what did you think of the 2015 All-Star Game, and where would you rank it in terms of, I guess, All-Star Games of the past? Uh, I don't know. I'm not that good with ranking stuff like that. It was definitely very entertaining. Westbrook definitely, he had that one dunk he had, that LU where he like, hit his head yeah. on the uh, backboard was ridiculous. So he's just a freak, freak athlete. And there was a lot of fun stuff going on with all the Hawks playing at the same time. Kyle Korver shot great from three, and yet times we had like four Hawks and LeBron on the court. That was really fun, and Westbrook going off, and then you had the whole Carmelo thing, and Carmelo played like 30 minutes from his home crowd. He shot really poorly, but he played big minutes, and we'll see what happens with him now that because I, a lot of people thought that he was waiting for the All-Star game to happen, and then he was going to get the surgery on his knee, so that was obviously a big story. It was definitely a really good one. I Last year was really good with Kyrie as well, but there, these things are usually fun, high scoring. So I don't know if I can really put like a place on it, because, honestly, going back to that, I don't even remember that many of the All-Star games. remember exactly what they happened. But it was definitely a very, a very entertaining one. For I felt the whole weekend was really fun. And I felt the, the skills competition on Saturday night was some of the best that it's been uh, in a long period of time. And I guess moving over towards that side of things for the All-Star weekend, Zach Levine. I mean, he's taken the NBA by storm with his performance in the dunk contest. Uh, Jason, do you think the dunk contest is back? Um... I don't know if it's back, but Levine, it definitely was very entertaining. Again, very entertaining. Levine was awesome. I thought, I figured he was going to be the favorite going in. Just seeing some of the dunks that he has done in the past, just like in warm-ups and stuff like that, the guy's a freak athlete, and he absolutely delivered in the dunk contest. I don't know if he'll ever be truly back unless more star players take part, but this definitely was a really good one, and I feel like Levine's probably going to be a part of this for a while. And like it would be great to see some a guy like Westbrook or LeBron or some of the bigger names do the dunk contest. But I don't think it's going to be dead as long as they see, keep hitting some of these good, exciting young players. John, it's just fun. So hopefully guys like Levine and some of these good young players keep doing it. It'll definitely fill them in. Um, do you think that while the Stars probably won't take part of this, I guess for fear of injury, that it's been a, a strong thing for a lot of guys like Zach Levine? Like, no one really knew who he was, but now people are going to, I guess, take a look at him for Timberwolves games, and the Timberwolves get someone else to look at other than just Andrew Wiggins. Yeah, for sure. And like, Wiggins is another guy who maybe he'll look to do something like this in the future. But yeah, some of these young guys that aren't as on, or aren't on as big a stage, 
they want to get their name out there more, like you said, with Levine. Definitely is a good opportunity to do that, show off their hops, and you get to, and like you said, maybe watch some of their games moving forward just to see if you get the chance to do that in the games. That's always fun. So yeah, it definitely is a good stage for some of these younger guys, and hopefully if the Stars don't do it, which I think I generally agree with you, they won't. Not many of them will actually do this, but if we get those exciting young players, that makes it fun too. Well, the, well, the there was there some was star some star power, power in the skills, skills competition, competition, more so the three point competition. It was like the best lineup we've seen probably in the history of that contest. Uh, Steph Curry took home the title. Uh, is this just a stepping stone for him for potentially being MVP this year, or is there someone else that could probably take that away from him? Um, well, right now, I actually believe James Harden should be the MVP. Steph is right up there. I think there's right now to me there's four really good candidates. I have Harden number one just because. He, the Rockets have had a great season, and he's. I think he just takes on more of a burden. He's more important. I mean, it, it almost gets down to the definition of the award. It's is it who's had the best season, who's the most valuable. When I mean, you look at Curry, he's having an amazing season on the best team in the league, and a lot of times that's what the MVP ends up going to. To me, it's been Harden because he has been almost as good, if not better, than Curry while playing a more important role in the Rockets. Because the Rockets have been great even without Dwight Howard for a long period of time. They've got, a, I think they're like 14-7 and seven without Howard this season, something like that. They've had other guys hurt. Terrence Jones has hurt for a while. Beverly has missed some games. And just there's not that many other guys on that Rockets team which really, can really create much offense. So Harden is basically playing point guard. He's basically playing shooting guard. So I, just, I think with that, right now he's up there, but Steph is right there. I think Anthony Davis is right there. If he can get healthy and keep the Pelicans in the playoff run. And then LeBron as well, but he's gotten the Cavs back into it. So I think it should be a really fun race down the stretch of that MVP. I think it's still up in the air. Um, I guess sticking with Harden, I guess the one thing from the All-Star game that I took away from is I guess OKC fans are still reeling because the Westbrook and Harden both combined to have a good uh, chemistry again. And it's just like, what could this team, OKC team, be if they hadn't pulled the trigger on the Harden trade uh, as soon as they had? Yeah, that's going to be a big just talking point for a long time just the whole the Harden thing. And, I mean, it's tough. You know, who knows even if the Thunder the Thunder offered him a lot of money. They didn't offer him the most they could have. But, I mean, who knows if he was going to stay anyways. At some point, he was going to have – he probably wanted to leave and be the guy. Going to Houston allowed him to do that. He's flourished into one of the best players in the NBA, one of the best offensive players in the NBA. And he wouldn't have been able to do that if he was still playing with Durant Westbrook. But even so, it's still weird that – I think that the Thunder traded him when they did. They could have gone another year with that trio, maybe gotten back to the finals. You have to wonder if when Harden, in that first year when they went to the finals and they played the Heat, and Harden really struggled in that series, maybe that spooked the Thunder a bit and worrying about his ceiling. Obviously, that didn't turn out to be that great because that trade turned into one year Kevin Martin. He's gone. They picked Steven Adams. He's a nice player, but he's not a guy you really build around. And then Jeremy Lamb, who's basically out of the rotation now, so looking back at it, especially in hindsight, it's not a good deal at all. And that, that, there's definitely has to be some Thunder fans wondering what if we would have kept hard and paid all three of them, and then Ibaka as well. That would have been would have been a ridiculous for some players, but fortunately for OKC, it didn't turn out that way. They're still still in pretty good shape though. In these next years that they can make the playoffs this year and then rebound next year if they stay healthy, and then the whole Durant free agency thing will be interesting. But that's that's not for another few years. Yeah, exactly. Uh, moving, I guess, on to next year's All-Star Game, is there anything the NBA can do to make the game maybe a little bit more interesting or anything? I mean, they do a really great job with it, but is there anything they could do maybe to spice it up for 2016 in Toronto? Um, I don't, I don't know. If the game itself, I'm not sure how much you could really do. I think maybe they could potentially. I think they talked about expanding the rosters to I'm the 12 right now to 15 maybe eliminate some of those guys that people feel are snubs. That could be decent to get more guys in playing time, spread that out a little more evenly. In terms of the game, the game itself, I don't know how much of this you do. If you want to add maybe events, I, I don't know if this has been talked about for All-Star, but I think it's been talked about for other stuff. Maybe do stuff like one-on-one tournament, three-on-three tournaments, stuff like that could be pretty fun. But from, I think what I've seen, like this year's event, a uh, whole weekend was pretty popular. The ratings were pretty good. So... I don't know how much they really have to fix, but those are, I guess, a few of the minor things that they could do to make it even more exciting. The only thing I guess they could uh, make sure they have is no Ariana Grande, because that was yeah. quite a yeah. boring, boring, boring performance. performance. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Uh, Jason, there were some big, big business news uh, discussed this week by the NBA in terms of the players' union rejecting the cap smoothing proposal, and now it's got a lot of speculation that we could be on the verge of a work stoppage for the 2016-2017 season. Um, do you see that happening? Um, I don't know. It'll definitely be interesting. I think the whole thing with the, the salary cap will it will be very interesting to see because they rejected the whole smoothing proposal with the, all that new TV money coming in. Yeah, and yeah. if that's the case and there's no other compromise made, we could see the cap jump from like I think 70-ish million next year to like 90 million in 2016. And that will obviously be a huge deal with teams will have a ton of cap space. It'll be a huge thing with for max contract. The max contract will blow up. So a guy like Kevin Durant goes into free agency in 2016, he'll be looking at a max contract at something like 30 million. And something with stuff like that with LeBron becoming the new vice president of the uh, Players Union and Chris Paul is the president. It seems like it might be trending towards the stars getting more of their money. So it's interesting to see what like, the middle class and the lesser guys think. And I mean, it wouldn't surprise me at all if there's another lockout. Hopefully, it's not one like last time, which almost killed the season. But I mean, it wouldn't surprise me with all this all this money coming into the league, and I'm not totally sure how it's going to be divvied in the self of salary cap. It'll be it'll be something to watch for sure. Now you did mention that LeBron was uh, the next, the first, the first vice president named by the Players Association. I mean, what are your thoughts on the move? Because I think it'll be, as you said, I think it's great for the star players like your LeBrons, your Chris Pauls, your Durants, uh, and what have you. But for those smaller guys that are riding the bench, I mean, this is something that could be uh, a big negative for them going forward. Yeah, for sure. It'll be interesting to see how they balance that, and I'm sure they'll try to want to take care of as many people as they can in the union. That's what they're there for. But with LeBron, like I said, with LeBron and Paul there, it seems like they're trying to grasp this and have, make sure the stars get there. It's weird. A lot of people thought with the salary cap in the NBA, with max contract, the stars really are, I feel like they're underpaid compared to other leagues. I mean, compared to like Major League Baseball, where it's, there's no cap and the stars are getting like $30 million a year and stuff like that in the high 20s. And then you have LeBron, who could, is probably worth, I mean, who knows how much he'd be worth on an open market. There's no camp, probably almost $100 million, but he's limited to like $20 million a year. So with uh, guys like that taking over the leadership, you would think that they'll probably be wanting to make moves that benefit the stars more, but I would hope that they also kind of look out for little guys as well. It'll be interesting to see how they do that. Because even the salary cap, will, with the salary cap going up, that should help. Some of the middle guys as well, because their salaries will go up as well. But in relation to the bigger guys, not as much. So, again, it will be very interesting. Yeah, because I really hope that they do look out for them, because those star players also have extra sources of income from shoe deals and other other commercial uh, rights. So, hopefully the little guys can be looked out for, because then we'll just see the mass expansion back to China and Europe and such of that nature. Um, Jason, now moving back to the court here, as the NBA comes back from this All-Star break on Thursday... Um, first of all, I guess, what do you think of how long this break is? Because some teams are probably really loving it, and some are just hating how long this is. This is the longest All-Star break in NBA history. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's good. I think it's definitely nice to have this extra break. I know some teams, like the Bulls, they play really, they're playing really well going into the break, and maybe they want to get back on the court. On the other hand, they could probably really use the rest. A lot of these guys will probably love the rest with these, with, uh, these long, grueling seasons. I know one of the things they've talked about, I think Adam Silver's talked about, is uh, eliminating some of the scheduling problems with all these back-to-backs, four games and five nights. And I think they had this extra all-star break to kind of help with that because the schedule was a long, grueling one. And these guys get all the wear and tear, so having this extra time off, it's nice for them to refresh their bodies, get it for the stretch one run. I'm not totally sure if they plan on doing it this long moving forward. They, maybe not. It looks like they're going to try to make these changes with the schedule with the back-to-back and games like that. But I think for this year, I think it's definitely a positive to have. Just get a little more time off and recharge the batteries and get ready for the rest of the year. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of for it as well with you because a lot of those guys do need some breaks. And teams like the Pelicans, I mean, this is kind of a huge break as their star player can now recoup that shoulder before uh, the action continues. Now, my original question here, Jason, was uh, which team so far in the first half of the season has impressed you the most and which one has disappointed you the most? Um, I mean, it's hard not to say the Warriors to be the most impressive. Their average point differential is almost 11 points a game. It'll be one of the best marks of all time. I think they're second in defensive rating. They're, no, they're second in offensive rating. They're first in defense. 
So they're a complete team, both ends of the floor. We've already talked about Steph. Clay Thompson is coming into his own. Draymond Green is a candidate for most improved and probably defensive player of the year. Steve Kerr's done a great job in his first year. But then I think you can't mention the Warriors without mentioning the Hawks as well. And the Warriors had higher expectations considering the talent they have. So the Hawks have almost been more impressive because I mean, people figured the Hawks were good. They were getting Al Horford back. They were pretty good without Horford last year. I think they were like the three seed when he got hurt. But nobody could have expected that they'd be, I think they're 43 and 11 right now, running away from the Eastern Conference. They're also great on both sides of the ball. They move the ball great. They're almost like the Spurs East. A lot of people like to call them is Mike Buttonholzer came over from San Antonio. So they're really fun to watch. So definitely those two teams, most impressive. For disappointing, it's hard to, the Thunder, obviously, huge expectations. They did have the injuries with Durant and Westbrook. That was tough. And I want to say teams like the Cavs were disappointing, but now they're starting to find a groove. The Bulls have been really consistent. I think some people expected them to be better. They're starting to find their groove a little bit as well. And the Cavs and the Bulls, even with the Hawks playing so well, I think a lot of people still think it might come down to the Cavs and the Bulls in the East. It'll be interesting to watch there. Besides that, other disappointments, the Kings have been disappointing. That whole thing has been a train wreck. After they started really well, they were 9-6, and six, and now they're like 18-34, and, and they're a disaster. So I think those are definitely the, te- the team biggest uh, surprises and disappointments. They're impressive and disappointments. I agree with you on the all impressive side of things because I really I'm blown away with how extremely well the Warriors have done and that Hawks run back in November uh, through December was just beyond impressive. But I would say for disappointing, I'm kind of disappointed in what the Clippers have done because they have had a lot of hot and a lot of cold stretches. I understand they're in the West, but a lot of people were picking them to be in the finals. The Clippers really are interesting because when you like you look at their numbers, they're first in the league in like offensive efficiency. Just been feel like that at all it feels like like you said that they're disappointing it just seems like it's really hard to get a read on them right now because they have no bench yeah they have yeah. like the biggest coming up especially with griffin hurt that hurts their depth even though they, even then they lose griffin and they've gone two and one they beat the rockets they beat the mavericks and right now the clippers are 35 and 19 still really good they have the second best point differential in the west but it just feels like they're going to be a team that could easily lose in the first round which would a huge disappointment. Of course, you look at them and they have Griffin and Paul and DeAndre Jordan, J.J. Redick. That's a really good core, but I feel like that depth will come back to bite them. That, that bench really is just not good. Austin Rivers, big baby. Uh, Spencer Hawks comes off the bench. He's been a disappointment. He's starting now with Griffin Hurd, but I mean, we'll definitely see. Like, I definitely, I think a lot of people definitely would agree that they're a team primed for first round exit and would be surprised if they make it farther than the Grizzlies. The Grizzlies are another really impressive team. They've been better than expected. The Grizzlies and the Warriors and some of these other strong teams in the West. So I guess another really huge disappointment is the Knicks. I don't think anyone expected them to be this this terrible <laughs> this year. But uh, I don't think anyone expected them to be that good. But 10-43, and 43, worst record at the All-Star break, that, that's pretty sad for them. But their, their future isn't completely in the dumpster. They shouldn't get a really high draft this year. So And they just bought out Amari. And so his contract's finally gone. So they still have somewhat of a bright future. And I, I don't know about bright, but it's not hope is not completely lost for the Knicks. I guess the thing for me with the Knicks is I didn't expect them to be this bad considering the 76ers are on a start to be the worst team in NBA history to start. And then the Knicks have now a worse record than the Sixers, I believe. So yep, they, it, yep, it, they do. the Knicks have worse record. They're 10 and 43, worse in the league only are the Timberwolves are right there, and then the Sixers are twelve and forty-one. So, so I'm for the, for the so, Knicks so, and Bello. Yeah, just been a been a disaster for the start of the 2014 since they couldn't land Steve Kerr, and it's just gone totally downhill. But back to the positive sides here, Jason. I mean, you, you mentioned the Atlanta Hawks and their record of being 43-11. and 11. I mean, they have blown everyone away with how well they're doing. They're first in the East. But do you see things coming to an end and them falling back to earth? Um, I'm not sure if they will in the regular season, but I did kind of mention this, that I think a lot of people are still wary of them in the playoffs because one of the big criticisms is, well, they don't have that star player. I mean, you, you could argue that guys like Al Horford, Jeff Teague, maybe are turning in the stars. They are stars are turning in the stars. But I guess it's not like the typical convent, like star like guy you can give the ball, he'll go get you 25 points a night in the playoffs. I think people are somewhat wary of that. I, mean, I think the way that they've looked on both sides of the ball, they're definitely 
I mean, I don't wouldn't pick anyone to beat them in a series right now. Maybe Cleveland, maybe the Bulls. I still think it could happen. I think they definitely could lose the playoffs. I, like I said, I wouldn't pick against them right now, but we'll see what happens over the rest of the regular season. And if the Bulls, the Bulls and Cavs continue to keep playing well and they come together, I feel like a lot of people will probably pick those teams to come out of the or one of those two teams to come out of the East because when you look at the overall talent level, the star power. And the Cavs are getting better on defense. The Bulls are better on offense this year with Rose starting to come back into form. I think some people still might put the Hawks behind those two in the backing order, but I mean, you can, it's hard not. Those doubters are definitely getting less and less as time goes on because they really have been impressive on both sides of the floor. Oh, absolutely. And plus, the way the Hawks shoot the ball, you can't really beat a team that can shoot that deep ball and, and do well on, on fast breaks and stuff of that nature as well. Um, Jason, there's the second place team right now in the East is the Toronto Raptors. And as a Canadian here, I have to ask, what do you think of how the Raptors have played so far this season, and can they make a run in the playoffs? Yeah, I mean, they started great. They hit a little, little lull there that they missed DeRozan for a while. They hit a lull. The defense really struggled for a while. I think the defense is still still could be an issue come playoff time. I'm not sure if it's going to be good enough to make a deep run. But, I mean, with, in this Eastern Conference, if, even with the Hawks, running away in the regular season. I don't know if there's anybody that's really like head and shoulders above everybody else. So I think even if the Raptors maybe are in that second or third tier of those top teams, I mean, if, if things break right, maybe if they look to make a move to maybe get an upgrade. Now I was reading Zach Lowe's trade article and he was talking about the Raptors who could possibly get into it if they look to trade a guy like Terrence Ross, who's kind of regressed a bit this year. He's been coming off the bench lately. They make a move. Even if they stay put, they have a really deep team. I don't know if they really have that bona fide star either. Kyle Lowry has come back to earth a little bit. DeRozan's solid, not the most efficient player. But and I definitely wouldn't rule them out. I wouldn't pick them to make it to the NBA Finals, but I don't think they can be ruled out because they're talented, they are deep, and so and since it's so wide open in the East, I don't think you can rule anything out. I don't think you can rule anything out. I guess for me the question is can they win a playoff series because they're just a Kyle Lowry jumper away from beating uh, Brooklyn last year and going on to play the Heat. So to me, it'll be interesting to see what they do. Uh, I did read that article as well from Zach uh, Love. And I I don't know. With, with Terrence Ross has been such a disappointment. Like who? But who can they really get? Because they have such a good dynamic, uh, Jason, that um, that's one of the things you're afraid of, of breaking up that great dynamic that Toronto has. Yeah, right, exactly. Like you don't know what, who knows what kind of deal that it would be out there for him for a guy like Ross, and if that will really make you better. They do have a nice, pretty nice rotation set. Like I mentioned their bench. They have Lou Williams, a solid off the bench. James Johnson has come into his own, and he's been starting lately, and he's been playing pretty well. And Grievous Vasquez is solid. They just have Patrick Patterson. They have a bunch of really solid players on that bench. A solid front court. Like, the defense, I think, this could be a problem, and they might just not have enough to get over past some of these other the teams like the Cavs, Bulls, Hawks like that. But said if there's an injury or something or something just you never know if the bounce is how they they break right for it, that could mean the difference in a close playoff series. Well, Jason, the one team you cover a lot of is the Chicago Bulls. They've had a solid season so far, but to me something just seems to be missing for the Bulls. Uh what would you say that is? Uh well the defense has definitely not been as good as it has been in years past. They do not They've never ranked outside the top five, I believe, in defensive efficiency under Tom Thibodeau this year. I think they're 12th or 13th right now. They're just not as good on that end. Uh, I mean, a big part of that, I don't, you can say that, I mean, Pau Gasol isn't, isn't a good defender. Joakim Noah hasn't been as healthy as he had offseason knee surgery right after the playoffs last year. And he's, it's taken him a while to get back into form. So the defense hasn't been as good. It looks better lately. But and even the offense has been a bit more inconsistent. Derrick Rose has been inconsistent as he works his way back from these injuries. He too has started to look a little better lately. I think a lot of people are kind of just waiting for them to show more consistency. They had a big, really good run in it was December. They won like 13 or 15 games, and people are like, we're just expecting that to carry on. And then January, Mike Dunleavy got hurt, and that turned out to be a pretty big deal. And they just fell back to the pack. I think the Bulls still have a lot of talent. They have. Decent depth. It's not as good as it was purported to be at the beginning of the year. Doug McDermott has, has he got hurt and he doesn't really play. Thibodeau doesn't trust him. Nikola Mirotic just kind of hit a rookie wall. But they still have plenty of talent on the roster. And if you look at their ceiling, I still think they could win it all if they can get more consistency and if D Rose can play 
be more consistent on offense. Uh, to me, I think for the Bulls, the two big issues is is Rose, and I guess the team's just trying to figure out how to play with him because they've done so well the past couple years without him in the lineup. And this home stands that you got that the Bulls have had just inconsistent there. So if if they can figure out winning at home, I think then they can be real that threat to really come make a run at the Cavs and or your Hawks and Raptors. Yeah, they've the home thing has been really weird this year because they've beaten they've still beaten a lot of really good teams both on the road and at home, but they for whatever reason they've just had problems against bad teams at home this year. They've lost maybe five or six games to teams that are currently under five hundred at the United Center this year. They've typically been a really good home team the past few years. It's just I don't know. They've talked a lot about how just the effort isn't there on a night to night basis like it usually is. They've talked about communication on defense and talking to each other, and that could be an, uh, playing into what you said about how they're kind of learning to play together. And You mentioned with Rose as well. He's just His offense has been hit or miss. He's been trying to find himself. He's, he's, there have been times where he's not really sure. It seems like if he's a jump shooter and he's been as aggressive going to the basket, but the last few games he has been more aggressive. And he just needs to show that more and more and not settle for those bad jumpers. So... If it does all come together, they have the makings of a great team, a team that could win it all. But we still need to see that happen down the stretch of the year and in the playoffs. Now, Jason, not only is the NBA getting back to the hardwood on Thursday, but it is the trade deadline on Thursday. And this seems to be a real exciting trade deadline uh, as the Nuggets look to be blowing the team up. And there's the Brook Lopez carrot hanging out there by Brooklyn. Uh, what do you? Who do you expect to be the biggest buyer and the biggest seller? Well, I know there seems to be a lot of chatter around the you mentioned Brook Lopez and then the Thunder. They tried to make a deal earlier in the year, and the Thunder, especially with Stephen Adams uh, being hurt right now, I think he's broken hand. He's going to be out at least three weeks, maybe a month. Who knows with that? That they could use a center because Kendrick Perkins just doesn't really cut it. So they could use a center like Lopez. I don't know if it's the best fit, but. He definitely is an upgrade. So if they try to package something, some of their younger guys that they might not use as much, a draft pick and use Perkins' as expiring contract, for that, that, that could, that's something to look out for. We talked about the Nuggets. They definitely seem to be in the selling mode. When I was reading that Grant Lowe, or the Grant, Grantland, is that, was that Lowe article, he talked about that they have a really high asking price for guys like Aaron Aflalo, Wilson Chandler, they're looking for several first-round draft picks. I don't think they're going to get that, but if they – lower those asking prices it wouldn't surprise me at all if they move them because the nuggets are kind of in flux right now they're it's been a, they've been a disaster they were expected to be at least decent maybe not a playoff team but not what they are right now so i know low also mentioned possibly moving guys like Farid, who just signed a big contract in the offseason or a guy like ty lawson i'm sure they wouldn't want to do that but they're not untouchable right now so i think definitely keep an eye on the nuggets definitely keep an eye on brooke lopez and i'm sure there'll be other smaller moves at least made because there really are a lot of teams that could win a title this year that's the championship is kind of wide open even if there are the Warriors and Hawks right now are way ahead of the pack in terms of record but I still think there's a ton of teams that could win it so there's a lot of teams that are looking to make maybe that extra move to get get themselves over the top so it's hopefully it's an exciting deadline do you think the Hornets because I mean there's the speculation the Hornets were going to move Lance Stevenson as they weren't super excited with him but now they're kind of making a, a strong push towards the playoffs uh that they'll keep lance stevenson or would you be surprised to see if he moved at the deadline um it wouldn't surprise me if he was moved because he really has not been good there even though that they they are in the uh playoff picture now or right there he just has not really worked out for them i mean it wouldn't be a huge deal though if they kept him either because he's only on he's on a shorter contract so it's not like he's a terrible deal for them but, I mean, if they did get rid of him, I don't think they'd miss him. I'm not sure how much they would get back, though, because they'd be selling really low on which just hasn't worked out. But it wouldn't really surprise me either way, just because of either you keep him and hopefully he turns it around for you, or if you trade him and if he's just been playing really poorly, it wouldn't, you wouldn't really miss him. Um, Jason, what do you think of this whole Sacramento Kings, George Carl situation? Because to me, this is just train wreckery like i i don't understand how a team can go through this many coaches in such a short period of time because it's the inmates running the asylum here yeah the king's thing is really weird the shy i mentioned earlier about how they get off to a great start cousins was playing awesome they were 
They're playing really good basketball. They were nine and six. They beat some good teams. Then Cousins got that bad case of viral meningitis. He went out, and the team started losing. And it seemed like it was like the perfect excuse to fire Mike Malone, which was they shouldn't have done it. It, was, it seemed like Cousins had really bought into what Malone was doing. His that it was a good fit for them, and it was working out, even if the team was starting to lose. I mean, you're going to lose some games when your best player is missing. So they used Cousins' absence and those losses as an excuse to fire Malone over philosophical differences or whatever, and then it's just been a train wreck. Since then, they've the run offices to talk about how they want to push the pace, play faster, and they have done that. They did do that under Corbin, but it didn't help anything. The offense didn't improve. The defense got way worse. And then they signed Corbin to the rest of the year, I think a few weeks after they fired Malone, and then they go out and fire him anyways and bring in Carl. And I don't know why they didn't try to hire Carl to begin with instead of going right to Corbin, but I mean, maybe hopefully for them they're thinking it'll stabilize now. I mean, they're obviously not going to go to the playoffs this year. They're 18-34, and 34, way out of it. But I mean, they still have some decent parts. Cousins is great. They have some other nice players. Their starting lineup has actually performed pretty well this season. When you look at some of the lineup the lineup data, they've been pretty good. Their bench is terrible. They're going to have to upgrade that either through the drafts. They'll have some money, I think, next offseason to play with and sign some guys. I don't think they're that far away from being a decent team with a better coach and Carl, with some more depth and continuing to get better. They're not but this year is definitely a for them. And not, I think like many people are not very impressed with that new ownership with Ranadiv, Ranadav, however you say his name. It, it seems like they're getting a reputation of not really knowing what they're doing with themselves. But maybe with a better coach in there and Carl, maybe things will stabilize a bit. The one thing with Carl for me, I mean, he's obviously a fantastic coach and one of the best coaches to ever uh, lead teams in the NBA is his health issues. I mean, is Sacramento kind of getting into a, a weird situation here where, I mean, Carl may have to leave due to his health issues? Yeah, it's definitely a risk. I know I was reading when uh, they were this process was playing out, they were kind of pushing him on that. Like, are you sure you're healthy enough to coach? You're going to be in this long haul. And I, got, I mean, I guess they were happy with what they heard. So I guess all you can do is just wait and see and hope that he doesn't have anything come up with his health that would make him have to leave and then they'd have to go fire or find another coach. So, I mean, we'll see. We'll see. Knock on wood for their sake. <laughs> yeah, I really hope for the best for Sacramento. Uh, Jason, uh, I want to thank you for coming on today. Uh, before I let you go, though, just uh, let the people know where they can find you at and ch- check out some of your stuff. All right. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Bulls underscore J. Uh, I write for a bunch of different places. write uh, SB Nation, their NBA site. I do some work for their Bull site, bloggable.com. I also do Bull stuff for about.com. And then I do some occasional contributing work for uh, Vantage Sports and then a site called todaysfastbreak.com. So you can find me a bunch of different places. You can see a lot. I usually link to all my stuff on Twitter, so bulls underscore J's Twitter account. And uh, thanks for having me on today. Oh, absolutely. It was a pleasure. And that's going to do it for today, everyone. Uh, peace out.